Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, can everybody hear okay? Thank you. Here's see some heads nodding. That's great. So, um, well, big lockdown caught us by surprise. I imagine it might have caught you by surprise too. So um, that's just uh, how it is um, at the moment. But uh, we were enjoying some uh, some time out on the big screen yesterday and um, went out from went out from SeaWorld and watched some whales. That was nice. But um, that's all cancelled now. We're talking to the guys and they tried to squash one last trip in after we got off the boat and um, then she's all locked down for three days of course so those fellows have got no work but um, I imagine too what's going to happen over these next few days uh, a lot of people are going to be hitting the hitting the screen and watching the Olympics I wonder if you've been watching the Olympics um, we've been doing okay in some things but not in others so so um, that's what you expect I suppose but um, I was watching the athletics last night and I kind of went off to bed, but uh, Kate tells me that uh, one of our one of our runners, Rowan Browning, he uh, he won his heat in 10.01 in the 100 metres, so that's pretty good. But um, that's his PB, but I don't know whether it's quite good enough to, uh, to win a final. But anyhow, yeah, so as Richard has um, mentioned, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, spiritual warfare. It's um, one of the items that we had on our list there that we sent out for speakers and so I've picked up that one and uh, thought uh, yeah I'll I'll give that a go so some of the um, books I've been reading as um, I've prepared for this is of course this one but um, I've got that one and um, the other one that I've been looking at is um, Be Rich by Warren Wearsby and uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a good, a good, uh, good writer and uh, clear and very practical. So um, we'll, just, uh, we'll just pray and just ask the Lord to encourage us as we read his word today. Heavenly Father, just want to thank you for the opportunity today to read your word together. And thank you that we have it in our hands today and uh, that it's, it's powerful and it's sharp and it's quick and all of those things. And uh, Father, we, <clears throat> we thank you for your word and we just pray that you would speak to us from it today in Jesus name, amen. So we're going to read a passage in uh, Ephesians chapter six. So um, if you have your, your Bible with you, turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six and um, we're gonna read that, that passage about putting on the armor of God. And um, we're going to start in verse 10. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and as you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should and will leave the reading there. 
And um, so uh, sooner or later, every Christian discovers that the Christian life is a battleground and not a playground. And uh, the enemy we face, of course, is, is, uh, is much stronger than we are apart from the Lord. We're not strong in ourselves. We are not strong in others, although other people encourage us. But um, our strength is in the Lord. And the psalmist, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my strength come from? Not from the hills. It comes from the Lord himself who made heaven and earth. Paul was a, uh, a prisoner when he wrote this, and uh, he was most likely chained to a Roman soldier in, in verse 20 of the passage that we just read. That tells us that he was in chains. And uh, Paul often chooses military illustrations, and this is no exception. He's spending a lot of his life with them, and he knows what they look like. And in this case, he knows about their uniform and equipment. And uh, the scripture, it exhorts us to put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand and make our stand against the devil and his schemes. Some of you will remember a song from a long time ago, a long time ago, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. So, um, yeah, you'll remember that song. Great old song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And, um, of course, we're living in a time when there's many wars and rumors of wars. And if you Google what uh, conflicts are happening at the moment, mate, the screen is full of stuff. If you um, have a look on the net as to the conflicts that are occurring at the moment, and of course the one that, um, or a couple that have been on our mind in very recently, of course, is the, the conflict in Myanmar. And, you know, wars come in many shapes and sizes. Some are invasions, some, uh, uh, in this case, a military coup where they're fighting against their own people. Um, and they, they come in all shapes. Some of it's guerrilla warfare. Some of it's just full on. Um, a few years ago, <clears throat> Ukraine invaded, um, sorry, Russia invaded Ukraine on the Crimean Peninsula. And of course, you know, the, uh, the odds were totally stacked against uh, Ukraine and there was little they could do to halt the invasion. <clears throat> but um, and we also, as believers, are in a similar situation <clears throat> in there's little we can do in our own strength, but finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And we can be strong in the Lord. Now, we're going to leave our passage in Ephesians for a minute. I'm just going to um, just have a little cruise around in the in the Old Testament and remind ourselves that. Um, that Satan is real, that the spirit world is real. <clears throat> I don't know what you believe about the spirit world, and a lot of people would be of the opinion, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a lot of fluff and bubble and there's nothing to it. But you and I, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that the spirit of God lives within us. We believe in the spirit world. And, um, as a, as a Christian, we need to be able to stand against the devil and his schemes because although we believe we have the spirit of God, evil and Satan are very much as alive and real also. And of course, they're there uh, trying to um, bring down God and bring down his servants, which is you and me. And we know though, that they haven't got a chance. We know that in Jesus Christ, we are gonna win that victory <clears throat> through him. And um, in, uh, in the book of Genesis, we find Satan striking what it appears to be the first blow of the spiritual war. And um, actually the battle belong, 
be, began long before the creation of Adam and Eve. And uh, Satan's rebellion against God is described in, in the Old Testament prophecies. And in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, it says, How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so when Satan rebelled against God, others joined him in opposing God and his purposes. And so Satan makes his first public appearance in Genesis chapter 3, not as Satan, but as a creature which God has made. And Satan comes to Adam and Eve as a fellow creature under God's authority and that of the, the man and his wife, and his temptation is heeded, and God's word is disobeyed, and that leads not only to the downfall of Adam and Eve, but all of their offspring, which includes you and me. And so that's the, uh, the, the first kind of indication that Satan is active, in the world that God has made. And, um, and then if we continue on in some other portions of um, the Old Testament, we see the events of the book of Job. And of course, they're believed to have happened in patriarchal times. And, um, and then in Job um, 1 and 2, we see Satan, he was gathered around the throne of God along with the other sons of God in Job 1.6. And he argued with God that, hey, look, you know, Job, he only believes in you and trusts you because you bless him. And um, as a result of that, God granted Satan the authority to afflict Job, but always within strict limits. And um, in the case of Job's adversities, they came first from Satan, but ultimately... These um, situations were allowed by God and um, God who has sovereign control over the events of Job's life and your life and my life. And um, Job never wavered. Praise the Lord for that. That's a wonderful testimony to us thousands of years later that um, Job never wavered. <clears throat> and... Um, an important thing that we need to note here is that not only that uh, the suffering of Job, which appeared to be of uh, very natural causes, though, was of satanic origins. And um, furthermore, we're led to see beyond the earthly drama to another purpose, a celestial purpose of um, God instructing not only Satan, but all the sons of God to God's glory. In, um, in 1 Chronicles, we see another glimpse of Satan's opposition to God and his people. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's mentioned in 1 Chronicles, but it's not mentioned in a parallel account in 2 Samuel. And this is the story of when David got up to um, count the people. And, um, and in Chronicles, in the Chronicles passage, it says, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, unless we had been given the revelation of this verse, no one would ever have attributed David's actions here to anything other than bad judgment. But um, behind his foolish and sinful decision, we find Satan ever seeking to oppose God through his people. And so this is just another reminder to us that Satan is alive and active trying to thwart God's plans and purposes at every turn he comes against. But having said that, I love this passage in Two Kings. In Two Kings, the, uh, there's a story of um, Elisha and his servant. And um, they were um, 
in, in Samaria, Samaria and they got up and the attendant of the man of God, he'd risen early and gone out and behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, well, ask my master, what shall we do? So he answered, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Those that are for us are way, way more than those that are against us. So praise the Lord for that. What a wonderful thing that is. And um, we, we can't see perhaps either those that are against us or those that are for us, but praise the Lord that um, those that are for us are way more than those against us. And then um, in the New Testament, we see also some, um, some examples of Satan intervening in the lives of um, men. And um, in, uh, in Matthew's gospel in uh, 16, 18, we learn that the church, which is soon to be established, is going to withstand the attacks of hell itself. And in Luke 22, 31, Luke tells us that Satan had the audacity to demand, to demand that our Lord allow him to sift Peter like wheat. So, and then um, again in, uh, in John, uh, uh, John 13, it was Satan who entered into Judas, using him to betray his Lord and to hand him over to those who would arrest him. And then Satan again is mentioned in John 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11, that um, Satan is the ruler of this world. So, but soon to be defeated, of course, on the cross of Calvary. So we can see from these, these passages that Satan is alive, he's active, the spirit world is real, and you and I <clears throat> need to be aware of that. And then there's a spiritual war in the, in the early church and early in the book of Acts, Satan is found opposing the people and the purposes of God. And in Acts <clears throat> chapter five, we read about Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, of course, who had a certain amount of money and um, they were giving that to the work of the Lord, but they lied about the amount. And uh, when Peter rebuked Ananias for his deception, he attributed the source of the lie to Satan. And um, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land in Acts 5, 3? And so again, we see Satan intervening in the lives of men and women. In Acts 13, 10, Paul rebuked Alimus, the magician, for opposing the gospel, calling him a son of the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul spoke of the church's reticence to forgive a repentant brother as giving Satan the opportunity to take advantage. And, um, and so we need to be aware, aware of um, Satan's activities in the lives of men and women. In, um, where am I? Yeah. Later in the same epistle, Paul speaks of Satan as the God of this world who has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And near the end of this epistle, Paul warns that Satan and his subordinates disguise themselves as true believers, therefore seeking to lead some astray by their authoritarian leadership. And so these are the, uh, the things that the, the devil or Satan is doing. In 2 Corinthians 11, it talks about uh, some of these false apostles deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ and no wonder for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light 
Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. And so as believers, we need to be aware of those that disguise themselves as angels of light. <clears throat> And so then kind of coming more now back to our passage, um, coming to faith in Christ Jesus is to be understood as entering into every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's in the, the beginning of this book, Ephesians 1.3. But it's also the commencement of a great struggle with Satan and his forces. And um, we need to... Uh, remember and take note that as we dwell on the blessings of our faith, also take note of the battle which we have entered into by faith in Jesus Christ and which we must wage in his strength. And so as we trust the Lord, as we follow him, our power and strength is in him. And um, the church, well, it's engaged in a spiritual war and its enemy is Satan. And there's a host of unseen angelic and celestial enemies whose power vastly exceeds our own. Um, and mostly our enemies remain invisible to our eyes, but, but they're real. And so is the opposition. And in this passage of scripture that we've read, um, these celestial beings seem to have various forms as is suggested by the variety of terms used by Paul to identify them. He calls them rulers, he calls them powers, he calls them world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places in verse 12. And um, I doubt that we can perhaps fully grasp the variety and number of those forces which oppose us. And um, we need to be reminded, though, that there seem to be various rankings of angelic beings and that the description of heaven in Revelation speaks of creatures which will probably not be understood by us until we're in God's presence in Revelation. It talks about that in Revelation chapter 5. Angelic beings of great power and Satan, he would seem to possess the greatest power and we as believers dare not underestimate this power so you know some preachers out there some speakers they will speak of satan as a wimp and as being able to turn him and maneuver him and, and bind him and do all of these things but from the passage of scripture, we have read, you know, how could we come to this conclusion from our text? To underestimate his power is to underestimate the immensity of the spiritual struggle and the corresponding needs which we have for divine enablement. If we are to withstand Satan's attacks, I would remind you that those who speak lightly of the celestial powers should be taken back by these few verses in 2 Peter. If you don't, if you think that this is just a walk in a park, um, in 2 Peter 2, 9 and 12, we need to take a second breath and it says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Uh, daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of insects, instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of these creatures also be destroyed. And then over in Jude 8, yet in the same manner, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. 
But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. For these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct. Like unreasoning animals by these things, they are destroyed. Do not underestimate the power of our enemy, Satan. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it talks about uh, Satan prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so he, uh, he wants to destroy our work, our witness, our life. And uh, especially those who don't take up the whole armor of God. And so in the in the uh, spiritual war satan employs a variety of strategies to oppose and defeat the christian and um paul doesn't speak of the scheme of the devil but of his schemes it's plural there's lots of them there are many and um when satan tempted our lord as recorded in matthew 4 and luke 4 he gave up for the moment he says but um Luke make, makes it clear that it was only for a time, only until he could regroup. And in Luke 4, 13, it says, and when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And so when that opportune time comes, he's Satan is in again. And so not only did Satan attempt our Lord with several different lines of approach, but he purposed to continue to tempt him when the opportunity presented itself. And Satan is an opportunist with an almost endless variety of schemes. And so probably at the present, Satan's opposition against the church is not uh, necessarily a frontal attack, although um, in some instances, it is at the moment with the the way that um, politicians are, are trying to change laws and rules and um, and even in our case here the the um, opportunity to try and um, give the uh, what's that so a lot, I've lost it. I've lost it there for a second. But um, euthanasia, the euthanasia laws, okay, all of these things, the abortion um, laws, the the marriage laws, all of these things, okay, are fairly full on. But most of the time, okay, it's guerrilla warfare. It's snipers. It's, um, you know, those types of strategies, um, intrigue, deception and trickery. They're the things that um, are trying to trap us as individuals. And so the Christians weapons have been divinely provided in Christ. And so in this passage, Paul's talking about putting on the full armor of God. And um, in <clears throat> the Lord himself, he, he uh, also put on the full armor of God as he opposed Satan. And when we put on the full armor of God, we are, we are actually... Um, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as we trust him, as we put him on, uh, he will protect and he will keep us. In, in Romans chapter 13, it reminds us to put on the armor of light. It says the night is almost gone, the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Okay, and I would suggest that the armor of light is the armor of God. God is light. God is love. 
and let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. That's Romans 13. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul's instruction to put on the full armor of God is a command. And uh, some of you will um, remember that uh, during, the, uh, during the Second World War, many men received a letter in the mail that began something like this, greetings from the Prime Minister of Australia. And um, that letter, of course, was notification of having been drafted into the military. And the greeting was not an invitation. It was a summons. One dare not ignore the letter without expecting serious consequences. So um, we were, those people were asked to <clears throat> join and they were commanded to join the battle. And Paul's instructions concerning the spiritual war are similar. Paul's informing every Christian that you've been drafted not to fight a physical war, but to fight a spiritual war. We're not encouraged to take up the full armor of God. We are commanded to do so. And these verses are our marching orders and we dare not ignore them or fail to carry them out to the letter. And our protection against Satan's attacks is assured only if and when we take up the full armor of God. And so Satan's schemes are many and he attacks us at any point he considers that we are vulnerable and thus we must put our armor on and it must be complete. And um, we put it all on completely equipped. And Paul's emphasis here is on the full or complete armor of God. And um, we must put on the full armor of God in order to stand. And that full armor is the armor that we need. And now, our, our duty, our duty as uh, believers and as Christians is not to attack Satan or to defeat him, but rather to withstand his attacks. Our task is defensive, not offensive. Those who would attack Satan don't understand Satan's power or God's plan. It's not we, it's not you and I who will defeat Satan, but Christ. And our duty is to resist Satan, not to remove him. And um, it's not our, our job to try and run Satan out of town. Uh, it is our job to stand and to withstand. We are to stand in effect and to stand still because God is the one who wins the battle. And um, in the book of Revelation, the saints who are overcomers do not defeat Satan. Indeed, many of them actually die at his hand. And um, But Satan's final defeat in um, Revelation 20 comes not at the hand of saints, but from the hand of God who sends fire from heaven. And um, in Revelation chapter 12, 10 and 11, it says, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God and day and night. And this is how they overcome him, this next pit. And it says, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. And because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even to death. So there's three things there that you and I need to be fully aware of. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life, even to death. Mm. And... Um, Back in the back in the Old Testament, you'll be reminded of the of the Egyptians 
sorry, the uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt. And they, Moses commanded the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians who are, you have seen today will never, you'll never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. And so as a result of that, the Egyptians were drowned in the midst of the sea. And so when the Christian is actively engaged in the battle, it is the Lord who wins the victory. David fought Goliath. The Lord won the victory. Right, so in our passage that we have read in, in Ephesians, it, um, it reminds us that the first piece of the equipment that we are to put on is the belt or girdle of truth buckled tightly around your waist. And uh, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And the, the scripture says in John 8, 44, but the believer whose life is controlled by truth will be able to stand and withstand. The girdle, it holds the other parts of the armor together. And um, the girdle, the girdle of truth. Truth. What is truth? Truth is the integrating force in the life of a victorious Christian. It's a man or woman of integrity with a clear conscience and a person with a clear conscience can face the enemy without fear. And unless we practice the truth, we cannot use the word of truth. And once a lie gets into the life of the believer, everything begins to fall apart. So we need to remember that the girdle of truth means that we as believers need to be men and women of integrity, of honesty, of openness. Men and women who follow the Lord. You'll remember King David. He lied about his sin with Bathsheba and nothing went right. In fact, his whole family fell apart. Everything was, was, um, was wrecked in terms of his uh, integrity. The girdle of truth. The girdle. It holds the parts of the armor together. The next part is the breastplate of righteousness made of metal plates or chains covered the front and the back. And it symbolizes the believer's righteousness in Christ. Jesus Christ gave his life for you and me. And if we have accepted him by faith, we are made righteous in Christ. Protected. It also reminds of the righteous life we need to live in Christ and in his strength. And in his strength, you and I can live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And the life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attacks or makes it easier for him to defeat us. So remember, the breastplate of righteousness, it's connected to the girdle of truth. They're connected, the parts of the armor are connected. And then on the... On the legs, the greaves, they also were connected to the girdle of truth. And so a, a Roman soldier was protected. The shoes of the gospel. Paul encourages us to put on the shoes of the gospel. The Roman soldier, he wore sandals with hobnails in the soles to give him a, a secure footing for the battle. And those of us who watch football or played football, footballers wear boots with stops in them. The athletes right at this moment on the running track, they wear spikes. It gives them grip. It gives them stability as they run, as they're trying to hit that tape in the, in the shortest possible time. It enables them to, to grip, to grip the ground, to be strong on their feet. And if we're going to be able to stand and withstand, then we need the shoes of the gospel. The, uh, the shoes of the gospel, where the gospel is preached, it's a gospel of peace. We must be at peace with God and with each other. 
if we are to defeat the devil. And may there be peace in your household today. <clears throat> peace with your family. Peace with your neighbours. Pray for peace. Peace, that, um, peace in the church that we might be able to be united and encouraged as we stand and withstand the schemes of the devil. And the readiness, it says, ready to share the gospel with a needy world. A victorious Christian is a witnessing Christian, one who shares his life and the gospel with those around him. The shield of faith, four foot by two foot, made of wood covered with leather. And as the soldier held it in front, it protected him from the spears and arrows and fiery darts that this passage of scripture talks about. Soldiers could stand side by side. The shields are interlocked so they could march into the enemy like a solid wall. And we are not in a battle alone. We have other faithful Christians standing with us. And I praise God for, for the saints at Karabi. Standing together today as we worship the Lord in spite of our circumstances. Praise the Lord for that and for the encouragement that we are to each other. And um, we are not in the battle alone. We have other faithful believers standing with us. And you and I have experienced saving faith. The faith mentioned here is the living faith variety. A trust in the power and promise of God and as we trust in the Lord on a daily basis we are re-protected from the fiery darts of the evil one Satan of course he fires these darts at our hearts and minds and doubts and hateful thoughts and lies desire to do wrong all of these darts are trying to get through our armor and if we don't quench these darts they'll start a fire and we'll just dis disobey God. <clears throat> the helmet of salvation, the mind controlled by God, a mind protector. If God controls your mind, Satan can't lead the believer astray. And so I would <clears throat> encourage you to make sure that your, your uh, mind is protected by the helmet of salvation. Put your faith and trust in the Lord. If you haven't, redo it. Trust him. Follow him. Be protected as you live for the Lord. And then Paul says to take up the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And in Hebrews 4.12, it reminds us that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart a material sword it pierces the body and requires the hand of a soldier but the word of god is living and active and it has its own power god's power and you remember that the lord jesus when he was tempted in um, in matthew uh, 4 he used the word of God to great effect. Satan had no answer for him and he left him. The scripture says, as we talked about earlier, he left him and was going to wait for another opportunity to have a crack at him. In Psalm 119 verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And may that be your desire today also to read God's word, to learn God's word, to memorize God's word. And so that you can use God's word as uh, an offensive to uh, stand and, we, and withstand against the attacks of Satan. And then lastly, in verse 18, it reminds us to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests be alert pray with one eye open prayer supplication intersection thanksgiving thanksgiving is a great prayer weapon to defeat satan prayer um, praise changes things 
as much as prayer changes things. The Bible says to pray in the spirit. We pray to the Father through the Son and uh, as a result in the spirit. In Romans 8, 26 and 27, it says, uh, in the spirit's power, we can pray in the will of God. Always keep praying for all the Lord's people. I want to read you that little passage in, in Romans 8, 26 and 27. And in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so keep on praying as we stand and withstand the, uh, the attacks of Satan. And may you, as you live your life, be able to trust and follow the Lord and daily put on the full armor of God. Start your day with prayer. Start your day trusting him and finish your day believing in him as you go to bed. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you.